Welcome to 30 and Nerdy. My name is David. You've got a dirty, whorish mouth. That's what you have. I just wanted to have a few things to say, and then we'll get into a short show. Uh, Once again, it's just going to be me, so if you don't like that, then you can turn off now. But I hope that's not true. But I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, why I'm doing a single show this week. Uh, Brady... The bears can smell the menstruation! ...is just getting the night off. Uh, AJ and KJ had some personal matters to attend to, and so that left me to carry the torch and to try and entertain you guys for hopefully about a half an hour, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. Who knows? And also, uh, just wanted to know, let you guys know, for the uh, few who listen, uh, which we are eternally grateful and thankful for, uh, and that you guys make it worth it, uh, especially those who talk to us on social media or uh, in private message. Uh, it's really nice to hear from you and just to talk to people who actually listen who aren't related to us in some way, shape, or form. But I will be taking a back seat for a little bit. I'm going to just step back and let Brady and AJ uh, take the mantle and push forward. And someone uh, will be taking my place, so there will still be three people uh, most of the time. And I just need to step back and, you know, take care of me and do uh, do some family stuff. And I know some people would say, we're only doing one show a week. And that that is shouldn't be too taxing, and, and you're right, that is not hugely taxing. But uh, with having to edit and make time for the show and work a full time job and have two kids, it just is too much right now. Uh, so I am just trying to even out the playing field for a little bit, just take a uh, pump the brakes and come back later with renewed. Uh, vigor and hopefully some good content I'll still probably pop in from time to time but uh, for the foreseeable future it will be Brady, AJ and some nameless other person Uh, I did want to point out a few things uh, from the last show which uh, I wanted to say a huge thank you uh, to you guys because you seem to like the uh, y'all mother truckers need metal And, uh, in that episode, uh, it was stated that I have a very basic voice. I would like to point out that I don't think I have a very basic voice. Uh, I think it is smooth and silky, bordering on sultry. Nothing to look at. Go back to work, everyone. Don't act like you're not impressed. But, uh, I may be preferential towards my own voice. I don't know. And also, I did want to say in my single episode about Warhammer 40k that I uh, picked or told you about a certain channel, uh, Lutine 07 or something like that, 09. Uh, And while that channel does have 40k stuff, the one that I was thinking about uh, is, trying to look through my list, is uh, 40k theories uh, and he does a wonderful job and they're all just tons of different things I can name off just a few uh, let's see here like Kaldar Drago and the world that was just talks about him and being sucked into the warp and how he comes in and out uh, is Shaitan the incarnation of the devil uh, and that's a chaos demon that was running or had run-ins with the uh, oh, Thousand Sons and Magnus the Red and uh, like who are the Eldari, what is chaos who are the orcs and just tons and tons and tons of content uh, and really well researched uh, so if you love uh, World of Warcraft, or World of Warcraft if you love Warhammer uh, 40k and the lore that goes along with it, not just playing it, painting it, uh, playing the video games, anything like that, then I would say go ahead and hit this one up because this is a lot of uh, time and effort is put into this, and he does an excellent job. Uh, and I also enjoy his voice, so it's that's always a, a plus to have somebody who you enjoy because there's a few channels that I will watch, but I cannot stand the person's voice. 
and so it just ruins the whole entire experience for me even if it's really well done and well put together uh, but once again that is 40k theories so hit them up subscribe not to them that would be wonderful if you enjoy it uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about is I came across a Facebook article and it was written in March of 2018 uh, and talking about 20 of the most controversial video games ever made and I just kind of want to go through and see whether or not we can decide that these were actually uh, worth being put on this list or whether it just was a hullabaloo about nothing uh, number one or number one number 20 they have Pokemon uh, for its early uh, days where there were uh, was Pokemon Jinx was accused of being racist and even satanic in appearance due to its face uh, bearing a resemblance to an actor in blackface and the design was later reworked uh, additionally, the mobile game Sensation Pokemon Go is the focus of intense media scrutiny after it took the world by storm in July 2016, as there were many reports of physical injuries, car accidents, and even death resulting from people playing the, the augmented reality game. Um, I don't know if the game can actually be blamed for that, because we also have texting and driving, people taking calls, distracted driving, basically. Uh, and people going to less than savory places to try and catch a super awesome Pokemon uh, which just you have to be aware and not be a dummy and go to places you shouldn't to try and catch something that's really not worth it in the end uh, and I would say that Pokemon Go is actually for all the bad that it may have caused was absolutely an amazing game uh, it got people out of their house I remember when it first came out I was we were still living in an apartment and we had a ravine behind our house with grass up to about my chest and I'm about six feet tall and it was pretty steep hills and people would be walking down the hill and you knew that they were trying to catch Pokemon because they had their phone out in there but it, it, it got people out of the house it got people walking I remember people walking trails because there are gyms on these bike paths not really paths, but uh, like actual trails, and they would uh, like here in in uh, Des Moines and Ankeny. There's a a trail called the Trestle Trail, and I think there's a bar or something like that uh, that's called the Oasis, and it's kind of halfway between Ankeny and uh, Madrid, I think. But I mean, it have the other place, but I know Ankeny is one of the starting places of the Trestle Trail, and then it goes on for about 20 or 30 miles or so. Um, and so I remember there are gyms all over the place and so people would walk for miles uh, just to go to these out of the way gyms that weren't really being held by anybody and doing their thing so I think that uh, Pokemon Go while in the beginning may have been poor in its choice of representation uh, and of course Christians are going to get their panties in a bunch about just anything and Anything and everything can be labeled as satanic to them. So that one I can see as the uh, the blackface uh, being controversial, but not really the... I can't see the satanic aspect of it, but that's also because I, I play uh, Chaos Space Marines. Or I like to play Chaos Space Marines. Which that reminds me, uh, if I did not stay in my uh, 40k podcast, that I probably am going to and have bought the codex for the uh, Chaos Space Marines because that's just where my heart always will want will, uh, will land uh, depends on how much Blood Angels army stuff I still have I'm waiting for one of my friends who has most of my stuff um, to see if I have a lot of Blood Angels stuff if I do I may go that route just because then I don't have to dump a lot of money into it um, but I'll always choose uh, Abaddon and his Black Legion and uh, end up hurting myself and killing myself while the other people just uh, stomp on me and have fun. Moving on though to number 19 Night Trap uh, released at a time when full motion video game genre was all the rage. Night Trap is a horror game that was released for the Sega CD in 1992 that plays out like a C grade slasher film with minimal input for players 
actually required to progress the story. Although the game was relatively tame by 1992 standards, and looks positively quaint today, Night Trap was heavily scrutinized in the same 1993 United States Senate Committee hearings on video game violence that would lead to the creation of the ESRB. And this just goes to show that Congress hasn't changed in a long time. Because uh, while the goal of Night Trap is to prevent the trapping and killing of women, it was claimed that the game featured gratuitous violence and explicit so sexual content, despite the fact that it contained no nudity or extreme acts of violence. Uh, and it was quite campy, and they re-released it uh, shortly uh, in 2017, I believe. Yep, it says it in the article. 2017 for PS4 and Xbox One in a remastered version. Uh, so I think, I don't know, I think it'd be kind of fun to play. Uh, but it was not acted very well, and it was one of those FMVs. And so I don't... I think at the time it may have been controversial just because people probably heard something from somebody and then they just took it and ran with it without doing any actual legwork to find out if the game actually had uh, sexual content or extreme violence towards women or anybody. Uh, number 18 we have is Hatred. It was an isometric shoot 'em up in which players control a misanthropic, mass-killing sociopath on a genocide crusade to kill as many people as possible. The, pr the surprising thing about Hatred is not that it was deemed controversial, but that its detractors are largely video game journalists, not parent groups or politicians, who criticized it for not being, not only being a poor reflection of the medium, but poorly made game to boot. Um, and I would kind of agree, it just was over-the-top violence, but not anything that was earth-shattering or actual really uh, good gameplay. And this is as far as I have made it. So we're going to be uh, moving into number 17 and into fresh ground. Uh, Doom was number 17. Uh, one of the most influential video games ever made, Doom, along with Wolfenstein 3D, helped pioneer the first-person shooter genre and launch a franchise that has continued to stay relevant a quarter century after its conception. However, while Doom is a gaming mainstay nowadays, it faced quite a bit of heat in the early days due to its graphic violence and satanic imagery, which drew criticism from multiple groups. The Genesis 32X port was one of the first games to receive an M for mature rating from the ESRB and receive increased scrutiny following the Columbine shootings on April 20th, 1999, after it was discovered that the perpetrators Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold had both been avid Doom players. In fact, Harris even wrote in his journal that shooting up his high school would be like playing Doom, which helped add up to Doom becoming one of the leading scapegoats for the ills of American society in the 90s. And we already talked about this in violence in video games uh, being blamed uh, for the latest shooting. Um, but you can't blame video games for everything. Uh, Border Patrol number 16. Border Patrol is a browser-based flash game, so there's your first problem right there. Uh, let's see here. Flash-based game that has you play as a border guard protecting the American border from immigrants. However, these intruders are neither evil or villainous. They are simply people coming in from Mexico. The game divides the Mexican individuals into either a nationalist, a drug dealer, or a pregnant woman. If you haven't noticed by now, the game is extremely racist right off the hop. It only gets worse, as the only goal of the game is to shoot every single Mexican who is trying to enter the U.S., no matter who they are. The game is so hated that it that an actual petition was created on Change.org to try and rid the world of this aw awfully racist and unneeded creation. Unfortunately, it wasn't successful, and the game is still readily available. And I probably would have to agree this game does belong on the list of of controversial games uh, for its mentioned uh, poorly uh, chosen premise of just shooting all Mexicans because they want to come to America and also because it's a flash game which are all horrible uh, Soldiers of Fortune I played this game and I played it a lot I loved it, loved the guns thought it was amazing uh, the first game, uh, the first of many first person shooters on this list, Soldiers of Fortune was released in 2000 
and was the first game to feature the Ghoul damage model engine created by Raven Software. This game is without a doubt best known for its extreme graphic depiction of the human body being dismembered by bullets. This engine made it possible for an unthinkable amount of violence, such as blowing an enemy's head clean off, shooting them in the stomach to reveal their bowels and blood uh, in a bloody mess, and even a microwave weapon to fry them. If you can find a more gory and violent game than Soldiers of Fortune, that is intentionally over the top in its dis depiction, mind you, be our guest. I would say that is uh, absolutely correct, very uh, controversial, but if you're a gamer then you are kind of used to it, uh, and it's not really anything besides that it's just a really good engine, or was a really good engine 18 years ago, um, that allowed you to pick your shots and choose them wisely. Uh, 14, Manhunt. And I would have to agree that this game, just for me, I never really enjoyed the premise of it. Uh, and I know AJ likes it. And I never really played uh, Manhunt, just because I never really enjoyed the idea. Like I said, I didn't enjoy the idea, so I didn't want to play it. Uh, but first released on the PlayStation 2 in 2003, Manhunt is a stealth-based survival horror game developed by Rockstar North, in which players control a death row prisoner forced to participate in a series of snuff films that task him with carrying out a number of different executions. While Man Manhunt scored well with critics and even spawned a 2007 sequel, the game's graphic violence did not go unnoticed by legislators and the media. Manhunt was even implicated in the murder of a 14-year-old, Stefan Pakira of England, by his 17-year-old friend Warren LeBlanc, in 2004, but the police and courts eventually dismissed the implication. Although it's been argued that Manhunt is a game that doesn't go or so much glorify violence as it does show how horrific it is, former Rockstar employee Jeff Williams wrote in 2007 that even the staff that worked on the game were made uncomfortable by the, its content. There was almost a mutiny at the company over the game, Williams explained. It made us all feel icky. It was all about the violence, and it was realistic violence. We all knew there was no way we could explain away the game. There was no way to rationalize it. We were crossing a line. And I think that's the important part. Uh, while games are controversial, they are a, 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 far, a, a form of art and a freedom of expression. And the great part about that is if you don't really like it, then you don't have to play it. You don't have to look at it. You don't have to read about it. Uh, I think that games are there and should be there to push boundaries to make you look at certain things. Uh, one of my favorite games of all time is a game that you can play and be in technically like 45 seconds, but that's skipping all the content. And it is Gone Home, and that was not really a story that pushed the, the boundaries as crossing a line, but it was a great narrative uh, that that uh, really just made you sit down and think about your actions towards somebody who is polar opposite of you. Uh, and so if you haven't played Gone Home, it is worth every single penny uh, because I kept on playing it, waiting for the shoe to drop where it was going to be scary because you came home to this uh, Washington uh, mansion and or mansion, it was a, a large house. Uh, that a uh, former doctor, I believe, owned. And it was uh, about half an hour into my play that I just knew there wasn't going to be these kind of jump scares that I was expecting because it, it felt like I was in a Stephen King novel. And you just kept on finding all these little clues and, and hearing all these little audio tapes and stuff like that. And it just, it's, the story is gripping. It's amazing doesn't really belong in this podcast as uh, uh, controversial games, but I digress. Go play it. Uh, Manhunt pushed lines, but that is okay. Pushing lines is great. Uh, Bone Town is number 13. is an adult adventure PC game that was released in 2008. The game itself follows a man whose sole purpose in life is to have sex with as many women as possible. That's it. The game got hugely negative reviews for its sexist content, its mediocre gameplay, and juvenile humor that mostly catered to 12-year-olds. The company that created the game, D-Dub Software, also hoped to set out 
and have this game create a new industry and marketing model for adults or for adult only gaming. Instead, they wound up with a load of controversy, no pun intended, we swear, on their hands. Uh, and I kind of agree that with Leisure Suit Larry and all those kind of kind of uh, games just don't really appeal to me or I don't know if, if you're that desperate for uh, getting your kicks off then there are millions of web pages out there you don't need to watch some stupid pixelated game made by a crappy studio number 12 a six days in Fallujah a tactical third-person shooter set during the Iraq war six days in Fallujah proved to be a con so controversial that it never made even made it to release a Konami and developer Atomic Games trumpeted the game's realism, but many saw this as being in poor taste considering the Iraq War was still ongoing at the time. Veterans and parents of soldiers who died in the war were particularly critical of the game, with Tim Collins, a former lieutenant colonel of the 1st Battalion Royal Irish Regiment, calling the game flippant and arguing that it's particular insensitive, or particularly insensitive given that the happen, or what happened in Fallujah. For Konami to release such a game... Bowing to pressure, Konami announced that it was stepping down as publisher of Six Days in Fallujah on April 27, 2009, and Atomic Games was shuttered later that year after failing to find another publisher. Uh, and I... I don't know how I feel about this one. While I do agree that you do need to be sensitive to the material that you're trying to put out, you kind of have to know your audience. And... So I can see why that would be a controversial game, but the public spoke and Konami killed, actually did the right thing and killed one game. Or maybe did the right thing. You choose. Grand Theft Auto San Andreas is number 11. Uh, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, or Grand Theft Auto series, has been controversial from day one, but the most famous example of this is GTA uh, San Andreas. Rather than the usual complaints about violence and foul language, San Andreas came under fire for its sexual content in June 2005. Less than a year after the game was released, a modder from the Netherlands named Patrick Wildenborg released the Hot Coffee mod, a reference to how the game handles its unseen sex scenes. The mod let players engage in a crude looking sex minigame and probably wouldn't have gotten so much attention if Wildenborg hadn't had developed the content himself. But unfortunately, San Andreas developed Rockstar had created Hot Coffee, and even though the studio disabled the minigame prior to release, they left it in the code. Um, and this one, I can see why people would say it's controversial, but at the same time, you had to mod it, you couldn't do it on the consoles, uh, as far as I know. And I just, I think it's a big stink about something that is really goes along with uh, Bone Town, in that it just is horribly depicted acts of sex that weren't really you know, it wasn't anything to shake a stick at even at the time uh, and even less so now but what do I know number 10 Bully Rockstar sure likes its controversy, don't they? Unlike games like Manhunt and Grand Theft Auto, which actually makes sense as controversial entertainment, the media storm around Rockstar's 2006 release, Bully, was blown way out of proportion and was based purely on studio's reputation for making violent games. A narrative emerged that Bully was a game that glorified bullying, that it would have a harmful effect on impressionable youth, whereas in actual fact, it was a rather tame open-world adventure focused on navigating social circles at a snooty prep school. Hardly the Columbine simulator, the anti-video game snake oil salesman and disbarred attorney Jack Thompson would have had people believe. In spite of the negative press, Bully earned positive reviews from critics and attracted a dedicated, dedicated fan base who continued to hold out hope for a sequel. Uh, I kind of agree with that. I don't think it was anything to shake a stick at. And uh, I also tend not to blame video games for the world's ills. But once again, we covered that in the violence in video games. Call of Duty Modern Warfare. Or Call of Duty 2 Modern Warfare is uh, number 9 on the list. Uh, as one of the most popular first-person shooter franchises ever made, 
It is inevitable that Call of Duty would generate some controversy, but nothing tops 2009's Modern Warfare 2 when it comes to the series' most shocking moment. Early on in Modern Warfare 2's campaign, there's a mission called No Russian, in which a player controls a terrorist who helps shoot up an airport. Technically, you play an undercover CIA agent, but this distinction did little to quell people's outrage. The mission was so shocking that the game even includes a disturbing content notice at the beginning of the campaign warning players about the offensive content. Uh, once again, the game gave you the option of not playing the level. If you were a person who was sensitive to these depictions of violence, then you didn't even have to play it. Once again, it was a freedom of expression where if you didn't want to play it, you didn't have to. Even if you played the level, you didn't have to fire your weapon once. You just walked to the end of the level and then you got shot in the face. Uh, but let's see here. While the mission doesn't technically require players to even fire a shot, and it actually... And it is actually something the game's designer put in to make people think about violence in gaming as a whole. There's a lot of fallout once No Russian became public knowledge. The game was altered in Japan and Germany to trigger a mission failed screen if players shot any civilians. And in Russia, the mission was removed entirely. And I say good on them. I can understand why that would be uh, in poor taste to have in those countries. Or in Russia, at least. Um... But at the same time, I always, I want to get the fullest ex, uh, experience out of my games. And so I always play those levels because I want to see the story. I want to experience everything that the developers have worked hours and hours and hours on. Uh, especially if it's a AAA title like Call of Duty. If it's a uh, indie, I usually try to stay away from those early on just to try and see what they're going to be like. But uh, I always love the Call of Duty campaign. But I don't, I don't think that was much of anything. I can understand why it was controversial, but I, I, don't, uh, I don't really get my panties in a bunch about a lot of stuff. So, number eight. JFK Reloaded. Uh, this little doozy was released in 2004 by PC, or for PC by Traffic Games and was marketed as the first mass participation forensic construction. In reality, it was simply a game that allowed you to carry out the horrendous assassination of John F. Kennedy and get scored based on how similar your approach was to the actual crime. It is extremely easy to see why so many people got upset about this game, as it lets you relive and recreate one of the worst days in American history. JFK Reloaded is simply a despicable game and should have never been created, let alone released. I would kind of agree with that. Uh, while I am a, a proponent of free speech and expression, uh, you just have to, once again, you have to know your audience, you have to understand that certain things just aren't going to make a good game and aren't going to be received well by people, and that uh, there is a fine line, and this is very fine, and that while uh, video games are not black and white, they are different shades of gray, uh, the line between No Russian and JFK Reloaded uh, you could fit the Titanic through and the intent I think is the, the biggest part for me of why this should be on a controversial uh, games list let's see here number seven New York Defender like most of the titles on this list New York Defender was created for no, no other reason than shock value however it goes much deeper than this this game focuses on the horrific tragedies of 9-11 and puts the player in control of people who try and stop an endless stream of planes from hitting the World Trade Centers. While we guess it's good that the game focuses on defending New York rather than destroying it, New York Defender is nothing more than in, an insensitive time waster. Thousands of people lost their lives on 9-11 and the national tragedy should not be used as a basis for a video game. Um, I would mostly agree with this, once again. They have the right to make it, and we have the right not to play it. And I would say that it probably is a big time waster. And here's one of my favorite games of all time, uh, is Mortal Kombat at number 6. Violence in video games wasn't anything new when Midway released the original Mortal Kombat in 1992. But this addictive arcade fighting game became a scapegoat among parents and public officials who decried its graphic viol or graphically violent content as corrupting children and society alike. Unlike more family-friendly fighters, such as Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat didn't shy away from the violence and gore, but rather embraced it as a key hallmark of the series. One of the game's signature features was gory finishing moves called Fatalities, such as Sub-Zero's iconic 
spine rip move. Thanks to its over-top over-the-top violence and engaging five-button control scheme, Mortal Kombat and its sequels would go on to become some of the most popular game, uh, popular arcade games ever released. But it wouldn't take long for politicians to take notice. In 1993, Senators Joseph Lieberman and Herb Cole spearheaded hearings over concerns of violence in, such, in games such as Night Trap, Leaf Enforcers, and Mortal Kombat, calling on the entertainment software industry to create a rating system or risk intervention from the federal government. And that's how the Entertainment Software Rating Board's ESRB came to be. Number 5. Custer's Revenge And I will say right off the bat, that this was a horrible game and I'm not sure how it ever actually made it uh, and it would probably I would put this at number one is the most controversial but we'll see what they have as the uh, next four games uh, Custer's Revenge came out all the way back in 1982 for Atari 2600 which makes it despicable or which makes its despicable content even more unbelievable the fact that this game is still able to offend people in 2015 dated graphics and all makes it hard to believe it ever made it to the store shelves in the first place. The game puts players in control of General, General Custer, already one of the most controversial figures in American history, as he makes his way from one side of the screen to the other in an effort to reach a naked Native American woman. In this game, Custer is nothing more than a bunch of pixels with a hard-on attempting to rape a woman. Offensive on multiple levels, it's no wonder Custer's revenge remains a blight on the game's industry over 30 years after it was first released. The amount of shock value this game must have had in the early 80s would have been staggering. Uh, and I would say that instead of having it, the, uh, what was the Atari game, E.T. be buried in the desert, I think that all the copies of Custer's Revenge should have been the game that we buried in the desert and then never tried to dig up. Uh, number four, Postal 2. Postal 2 is a first-person shooter game released in 2003 and is one of the goriest that you'll ever find. This game, this is a game where almost unthinkable acts of violence and racism appear on a near constant basis and in a number of different ways. It seems as if the main goal of this game was to offend its players and it does a good job of that with things such as being able to put a gun up a cat's anus and then use them as silencers. While you could rate Postal 2 as a success based on its ability to offend, the game was most definitely not a success with critics or in terms of sales. Somehow that didn't stop developer Running With Scissors from releasing a third game, which of course was also awful in this controversy and public reception. Uh, and I would have to agree, Postal 2 is just too over the top, too nasty, and just awful. And also not fun to play. Uh, VTech Rampage is number three. This is a horrific game that was released only a few weeks after the awful Virginia Tech shooting in which a gunman shot and killed 32 people in, with, in one of the biggest mass murderers in American history. A flash-based game, which we already also know is a death knell for actually having a good game. I'm sure there are some good flash games out there, but I just find that that probably is a fantasy and not a reality. A flash-based game that puts you in the role of the shooter and allows you to kill a bunch of pixelated students, VTech Rampage is simply a classic case of one terrible person trying to take, uh, trying to make a buck and a name for himself on the back of a horrific tragedy. Unsurprisingly, the game's creator, Australian native Ryan Lamborn, would go on to make an even worse massacre simulator based on the Sandy Hook tragedy. Number two, ethnic cleansing. Already an awesome title for an amazing game, right? Wrong. Ethnic Cleansing is a first-person shooter game released in 2002 by white nationalist organization National Alliance. In the game, which takes place during a race war, the, players, the player controls a neo-Nazi or a KKK member who is given the job of killing various stereotypical minority characters, with the final boss being former Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon. As you can imagine, the game was hugely controversial and was criticized greatly for its racist and generally awful content. And I would have to agree, I still think Custer's uh, Revenge is worse, but only slightly. So I can only wait to see what uh, number one is. And Oh, okay. So I can kind of see that maybe the top three would be uh, number one, which we'll talk about in a second. 
ethnic cleansing, and Custer's Last Stand. Or Custer's Revenge. Uh, and number one is Ray Play. Here it is. We finally have come to the most abhorrent and offensive video game ever created. Ray Play. Released in Japan in 2006, this abomination of a video game has players take the role of a male character who stalks and rapes a mother and her two daughters. Numerous countries have banned this game, and rightfully so, as the game offers nothing of value to anybody. Well, except rapists, we suppose and simply allows the player to follow and eventually sexually assault females in a wide variety of positions. There is absolutely zero reasons for this game to exist, and I would have to agree that it is just awful, and I, I don't know how this game even got made. The graphics aren't terrible from the picture, I haven't played it, uh, and never will, but time and effort was put into it, uh, and... That is time that was not well spent. So that is the 20 games from this Facebook article uh, with me horribly reading the synopsis of each game. Uh, do you agree with this list or do you not? Let us know in the comment section. Uh, I also wanted to talk a little bit about some games that are coming up. Uh... And just a small little list and give my spicy pick for what I believe is going to be one of the, the best game on this list. Uh, we have Shadows of the Tomb Raider. And I've never really been a huge fan of Tomb Raider just because I never got into it. Uh, they are great games. They have gotten a lot better. Uh, graphically, of course. Uh, no more square boobies, but that's about uh, all I can tell you. Destiny 2 Warmind is hopefully trying to bring back all the people to uh, basically do a uh, World of Warcraft and give a new expansion to bring back the player base and try and shell in some more money for a single player game that has massively multiplayer tendencies. The worst one on this list, I think, Final Fantasy VII Remake. And we've talked about this before uh, multiple times. But this is a game that we do not want made. This is a game that is going to be have the, uh, I think, Final Fantasy XV combat style instead of the wonderful turn-based style of Final Fantasy VII, which is what everybody wanted. Beautiful graphics and Final Fantasy VII uh, tactics. Not what we're going to get. So I'm going to be staying away from this one. Won't touch it with a 10-foot pole. Uh, Overkills, The Walking Dead. This one actually looks really good. Uh, from all the trailers that I've seen, uh, looks interesting. I enjoy that it's getting away from the Telltale games. Telltale uh, games are really great and very, very well uh, put together and well done in the form uh, that they they go with. But I'm interested to see uh, how this uh, goes, whether it's going to be third person over the shoulder, whether it's going to be first person, uh, and I also just love all uh, things zombies, so... I'm excited to see uh, what they do with this one. Uh, Red Dead Redemption 2. I know AJ is not excited about this because he doesn't really like Rockstar games, but I am excited for this. I loved Red, Red Dead Redemption 1, uh, and I just can't wait to get back into the world of uh, John Marston, even though I know you're not playing John Marston as John Marston, but uh, I'm excited for this one. Uh, Ori and the Will of the Wisps. This one is not my spicy pick, but it was almost. Because this one, just the art style and the sentiment behind it from the from the trailers that I've seen, uh, just have it top-notch for being one of those games that's going to be kind of a journey-esque, uh, gone home, just great narrative-driven uh, story. Um, and I think that is going to be one of the great games. It's not going to be a AAA uh, blockbuster another one Metro Exodus uh, I have played the first Metro uh, not Dying Light and I loved I didn't really enjoy the gameplay but I enjoyed the story behind it and I loved the novels that they are based on and so while I probably will not get this when it first comes out I'll probably get it at some point in time just because I want to play the story so I'll put it on easiest and just fly through it just so I can hear the kind of audio uh, audio drops and the cutscenes and 
all the little collectibles that you can find. A uh, big one that I'm really hoping for uh, to be and break the mold for what superhero games have turned into, which is parental cash grab by kids or by parents for kids uh, who think that they will like this because it has their favorite um, superhero in it when it just is a crappy game. Uh, Spider-Man. And uh, I am super looking forward to this one. And I know several of you are, and I know Brady is. And also AJ. Uh, coming in second to last uh, on this list, Darksiders 3, which is coming up. And I love the first two, and so I will probably delve into this one. Once again, probably won't buy it right off the shelf, as the uh, gaming budget is quite stringent. And so this will have to be a, a pickup used, probably. But Darksiders 3... The one game that I am looking forward to and is going to be my spicy pick for the future. It's spicy! Coming out in 2019 is Days Gone. And I just, I love the idea of a dystopian future. I love all those things. Uh, I love the road, uh, the movie and the book. And uh, I just enjoy that idea of mankind kind of being pushed to the brink and having to try and claw its way back. And so I think that Days Gone is just going to be, uh, from Ben's studio, uh, a wonderful game uh, from everything I've seen and hopefully will see at E3 this year, which is June 12th to June 14th. I'm hoping to see and hear a lot more about this game and many others uh, and cannot wait for, for those uh, streaming live events because I took that whole entire week off so I could just sit down and watch and, and probably record a little bit of stuff about it. But uh, let us know in the comments, uh, once again, if these were some of the controversial games or if you have something that they missed on this list and uh, which games you're excited for coming out. Uh, once again, I just wanted to say a fond, not final farewell, but fond farewell. Uh, Ta-ta for now, toodaloo for later. <laughs> ETFN, ta-ta for now! <laughs> and I just wanted to add that I, I am very thankful for what you guys have allowed us to do and that uh, hopefully we will continue to be pushing out content every week and just thank you good night and i'm ron burgundy go fuck yourself san diego